Hello, let's look at the treatment of unipolar depression. And we are dealing now with those patients that are resistant to treatment. So we have tried to give treatment initially. Then we have tried to give a maintenance treatment. And these patients are still resistant, meaning it does not work. The medications, the tablets does not work against this uh, severe depression that the patient has. So we need to do something now. This is the treatment options that we see when the patients are in big trouble because nothing works. So this means that the response after at least two trials of this antidepressant monotherapy, monotherapy means that you had one medication, you usually give antidepressants monotherapy, which means you give one type of antidepressant and then you switch to another type and then you give monotherapy of the other one. And we have tried at least two trials and it is not functioning well. Then, then we call it treatment-resistant depression. So first trial, second trial. Okay, and now we need to do something. We know that the treatment is not going well when the PHQ-9 questionnaire, I made a video about this, so check that out. It consists of nine questions that you ask the patient and then you can standardize the patient's symptoms, actually. So it means that we have, for example, in the beginning, Let's say he has six symptoms and then with treatment, he gets less and less symptoms. And if the PHQ-9 does not decrease by more than 50%, then it's not good. Then it's, then it's, then it's not functioning. So it needs to decrease at least with 50%. So please check that video out. It's very good, very quick. It, it, it will summarize the points, the nine questions that you need to ask every patient. What has to be done before changing the antidepressant therapy? What we'll do, we'll reassess the diagnosis. Is this really dep depression or is it something else? Is it schizophrenia? Is it bipolar disease? Is this really unipolar depression? So we reassess the diagnosis because maybe it's another disease and therefore the medication does not, does not work. We, may, we maybe need to treat this patient against another disease and then it would work so please reassess the diagnosis assess the adherence so compliance check if the patient is really taking the medications and usually this will be uh, best done if you do it in the hospital so the pa patient will be in the hospital for one two weeks and then you can really give the patient in his mouth and he has to show that he's actually swallowing the medication and then we will see if this phq9 score is getting better or or, or worse and if we see that it's getting better, maybe then uh, this patient dis did not take the medications properly at home. So we need to really talk to this patient about compliance and why it is so important that he continues to take the medications. Assess the number of weeks of therapy. So we will look at how many numbers of weeks do we actually need to treat this patient. Maybe he, he requires 12 weeks. Maybe it's not enough to do six weeks or maybe we need to have a maintenance treatment with more than one year, one can say. So there is this continuous treatment, the maintenance treatment. I dealt with this in another video. A continuous treatment being four months to one year and maintenance treatment being one year to three years. So please reassess the number of weeks of therapy. Refer to a psychiatrist if the patient is resistant despite proper treatment. Of course, usually these patients are actually treated by psychiatrists, but I would say more and more we see that family physicians are taking responsibility for depressed patients and psychiatric patients in general because it is much, much more convenient for this healthcare system that we have family doctors that can do it also because we don't have so many psychiatrists. We have many more family doctors and therefore it would be good if the family doctors would know all the treatment options available and would know what dose to give and what therapies are good, how to recognize psychiatric diseases. So in the future, I would say family, family medicine will become huge because family medicine will be able to treat many, many more types of patients, not just the regular influenza and so on. So please... If you're a family doctor and you don't know really so much about psychiatric diseases, then, of course, make a refer to psychiatrist and then you're in the short side. That means please check the, the medications that the psychiatrist was, uh, was written, so uh, was giving this patient, and then please learn from this. What 
what are the psychiatrists giving to these kind of patients? So referral to a psychiatrist really important if you don't if you if you cannot handle this patient, you see that the patient is resistant against the treatment. So these are the things that you need to do. Uh, these four things, okay? Then the definition of mild to moderate depression is when we have a pH pHQ nine score of less than twenty points, because everything about above twenty points is severe. So here you see the graph. We have depression already at ten points. Then we have severe depression from 20 points. Maximum score is 27. So please check the video out. This is the PHQ-9 questionnaire. So we know now that mild to moderate is until 20 points. We have two treatment strategies that we can use now. What can we do? We, can, we have an adding treatment and a switching treatment. Adding treatment, as the name suggests, is that we have a medication, monotherapy, but we add, it, we add another medication to, together with it. Then it's a combination therapy. It's not monotherapy anymore. It's a combination therapy. Usually we can, for example, give SSRI, like sertraline, together with an escitalopram. This is a very good combination. I have dealt with it in another video. These two medications are one of the best combinations that you can give, an SSRI and an escitalopram, and then you have an adding treatment. It's a combination treatment. Or we can do a switching treatment instead. That means that we will up the first medication that we gave and we will continue with another one okay that's the switching treatment so this is the two options that we have either you add one more or you remove one and add another and then we are still going with monotherapy monotherapy means one treatment what does adding tre treatment mean adding means that as we said we added a second antidepressant together with the first one that's an adding treatment Okay, simple to understand. Switching treatment, it's an adding a second depressant, but we are removing the first one. That's a switching treatment. So what can happen if we combine a monoamine oxidase inhibitor with another antidepressant like SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors? So if we combine monoamine oxidase inhibitor with an SSRI, what can happen? This is the adding treatment. Therefore, I'm saying it's very important to know which combination you give. For example, a sertraline, which is an SSRI, together with an escitalopram, is a very good combination. But in, when you give a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, you can get a serotonin syndrome or a hypertensive crisis. Serotonin syndrome, we will have a lot of symptoms. I will not deal with all the symptoms of serotonin syndrome. We will make another video about that specifically, but please check that out. Serotonin syndrome is important to recognize when you're dealing with monoamine oxidase inhibitor together with an SSRI. So this is a combination treatment, uh, an adding treatment, serotonin syndrome. So please check the symptoms out. Hypertensive crisis just means that we have a high blood pressure, more than 180 or more than 120 diastole. And this will be also dealt in another video. So these two things can be seen when you have this in combination. And then we need to treat this because hypertensive crisis is really dangerous. So serotonin syndrome and hypertensive crisis. Remember that with monoamine oxidase inhibitors. The three things that we need to exclude in mild to moderate depression are which ones? No suicidal ideation, no psychosis, and no aggressiveness. So when you have mild to moderate depression, you need to exclude three, three things. No suicidal ideation, no psychosis, no aggressiveness. Otherwise, it's not mild, and it's not moderate, and it's severe. So no su suicidal ideation. You ask the patient simply, did you think of ending your life? Did you have any uh, thoughts about this? And so on. You need to recognize this. No psychosis. Uh, so psychosis like delusions or hallucinations, hearing uh, hearing words whispering in your ear or seeing stuff that are not there or having delusions, thoughts that are completely unrealistic. Okay, these are delusions. This is a psychosis. And also I would say that uh, psychomotor retardation can also be regarded as a, a psychosis. It's meaning that you are very slow. You're moving too slow and you are re re really so. Psychomotor retardation it, it causes. No aggressiveness. So aggressiveness is also something that uh, is uh, many times in a hospital seen as a psychosis. So psychosis is delusions, hallucinations, or psychomotor retardation, or aggressiveness. These are very um, distinct things that are not there in mild and moderate disease. It, instead, it's more severe disease. Okay? So these three things have to be excluded to say it's a mild to moderate depression. Do we need to treat patients with mild to moderate depression in the hospital? No. 
Therefore, I'm saying you need to exclude these three things. You, you need to have a PHQ-9 score, as we said, less than 20. Then you have mild to moderate depression. And then we don't need to treat the patient in the hospital. But it's recommended to offer a daily hospital program setting. It means that the patient will come back for, for let's say, tomorrow. We will, have a, we will ask the patient, can you please come back at 9 o'clock? We will check if everything is fine. It will not take long time just 20 minutes, half an hour, then you can go home. And let's say we will have an, another follow-up visit in one week and then maybe in one month. So this is a mild to moderate depression that we can treat at home, okay? And then we excluded three things and THQ score nine, uh, less than 20, okay? Not mild is going home, severe is going in the hospital. Is it possible to change more than one medication at the same time? No, please. When you switch medications, only switch or change one medication at a time. Okay? Please remember it. Because otherwise, you don't know which one is actually effective. You're tapering down one medication, and then you're looking at the symptoms. And if you see that the symptoms are getting worse, then you know that that medication is actually good for the patient. If the, and if you, if you add another medication, and you see that it's getting worse, then you should not give this medication. And the opposite is true. So when you add a medication, it's going really good, then please follow, follow through with this medication and stop the other one which you have. But only switch one at a time. Don't, don't do uh, all, all, all the things at the same time. You cannot stop two medications at the same time and then replace it with two another. That's not the good way to do. So please look at the left column. That's the way, not the right column. Good. When is it better to change a medication rather than adding a new one? When should we change a medication, which is switching therapy, instead of having an adding therapy? As we said, we have these two things, adding therapy, switching therapy. When is it better to have a switching therapy instead of an adding therapy? When there are a lot of side effects with the first one, then it's rather better to switch it. Okay? And we, we, we will do a switching. And uh, that, that you can really just ask the patient, how many symptoms do you have with this medication? A lot. Then please switch it. There's no reason to continue with that if the patient complains about a lot of side effects. Could be diarrhea, vomiting, uh, sexual uh, dysfunction, and, and, and so on. There are many, many symptoms that you can see. Is compliance better with a monotherapy or a combination therapy? What do you think? Do the patient take their medications if they have only one or if they have five to take or two or three to take? Of course, it's a monotherapy. It's co of course, they will have a higher compliance with only one medication. Usually, patients do not, does not want to have a lot of medications. Therefore, one can say that the switching therapy is, more, is better because we're uh, looking at one uh, medication and if that, that does not work, then we switch to another one instead of adding therapy, which would then have, the patient would have two medications or three medications, and then we have this drug-drug interaction, interactions and so on. So it's better to have monotherapy, left column, instead of the uh, adding therapy in that sense. And the benefits with switching therapy compared to adding therapy, I mentioned some already, reduce the side effects. So we will have less, less side effects because we have less medications that we give the patient. Monotherapy, so one medication, will lead to higher compliance. Which we already said that. Compliance, the patient will take one medication easier than he will take two medications. It's cheaper, of course. This can be a problem for the patient if he takes two, three, five medications. It will cost, okay? Of course, uh, the state can give you some uh, help, but usually patients need to reach out in the pocket and pay for themselves. So it's cheaper for the patients also, and therefore compliance uh, will be higher if, it's, if, the, if it does not cost so much. Then less drug-drug interactions. This is one of the most important things. So more side effects are reduced, and we have less drug-drug interactions. And this is a huge point, because I would say 90% of doctors cannot predict more than 90% of doctors cannot predict all the drug-drug interactions that we have. So I would say that drug-drug interactions are uh, very dangerous because if the patient comes in, have a list of five medications, 
the doctor asks, what symptoms do you have? Then the patient starts to tell all the symptoms. And it's almost impossible for the doctor to say that, is, 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 are these symptoms due to this medication? due to this medication or due to this combination or due to the combination of these three or combination of these four or combination of these there if you if you count how many combinations and drug drug interactions there are you would be amazed okay and therefore it's almost impossible and therefore i say go for monotherapy one one tablet then switch that then if that doesn't work, switch that until you find a good medication and then you can possibly add an adding therapy but i want to say a big but here if you are dealing with psychiatric disease now depression but you also have hypertension let's say your blood pressure is high then it's not the same thing please then you need to take a medication for the psychiatric disease to so depression and you also need to take for hypertension of course there exists drug drug interaction between these, these two medications but these two medications are for different purposes one you cannot stop your hypertension medication just because you're you are having a depression and you need a monotherapy monotherapy does not mean in the sense that you only need one tablet at all so what, what i'm saying is monotherapy is dealing with only psychiatric disease here maybe you have a medication for your hypertension maybe you have a high, uh, medication for your diabetes mellitus so you have sugar problems you have blood pressure problem then you need to take medication for both of these and then you take a monotherapy against depression it's still a monotherapy because this is related to depression okay so as a patient, never stop your medications without talking with your doctor. Please don't do it. Because then if you stop your hypertension medication, you will get a hypertensive crisis. You can get a stroke and you will kill yourself. That's it. It's so simple. And I've seen that many times. That the patient said, no, but my blood pressure was normal. So I stopped the medication. But they don't, they don't figure out that the, the blood pressure was normal because you took the medication, not without it. So when you stop the medication, after two weeks, when the effect starts to decrease, because you have a lot of medications in your body accumulated, and then if you, if you stop it today, maybe it will be good tomorrow also. It will be good, uh, let's say, a week, it, a, a complete week. You will have a very good blood pressure, and you're not taking any uh, medications. And then you think... That, you see, I'm good without my medications. I don't need this blood pressure medication. And then suddenly, let's say in the second week, you get a hypertensive crisis because the accumulation of the medications is removed. It's, 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 uh, your body is uh, free of this medication. Bam, you have a hypertensive crisis, you get the stroke, and you die. And the relatives don't understand what happened. Okay? How many times should one switch the monotherapy until deciding on adding the therapy? Did you understand this question? How many times should you switch one medication to another one, then you stop that, then you switch to another monotherapy, until deciding that, okay, let's do an adding therapy now. Usually three, three trials. But this is not written in stone. You can have four trials or two trials. It all depends on your doctor. And your doctor always knows you, you best. So if I'm saying three trials because I'm usually doing three trials, then that does not matter. Um, then that does not matter. Okay. If your doctor says two trials or one trial or five trials, up that's up to the doctor. Okay. This is not written in stone. It, it's not scientifically proven that you need to have three trials. But as a usual guide, around three, four times, if you have try to switch the monotherapy then it's advisable to do an adding therapy instead so instead of uh, switching all, all the time then maybe a combination of two drugs would be actually better for at least how much time should the medication be tested until switch to another one six weeks this is not happening in one day you have at least six weeks and then you, you test one medication and then you switch to another one. Six weeks. It takes time for medications, especially for um, psychiatric diseases like depression. It takes time. Blood pressure also. It can take one, two weeks until you start to see an improvement. And the same goes with the, with, when you stop the medication. It can take two weeks until you see that the blood pressure increases again. 
So uh, you need to have patience here, six weeks. When should the medication be stopped? Earlier than six weeks. Let's say that we, we need to stop this earlier. When, when do we start stop, uh, stop it and change it to another one? By side effect, of course. If, the, if you give this medication and you see already at the second, third day that the patient is having huge complaints, then, then you need to switch it before, uh, before six weeks because it will not be better in five weeks. But one big but here again, there exist medications that when you see side effects, you should not immediately be afraid because these side effects can actually reduce. They, they, they can be lower and lower. That means if you see side effects in the first, second, third day, it does not mean that we need to stop it. But if you see it, let's say after one week, and still the symptoms are not getting better, it's actually getting worse, of course, then you need to switch it. But I would say if you're getting desensitized, your body is getting used to this medication, getting used to the side effects, and the side effects start to disappear, then you can continue with the medication. So don't be afraid just because you took a medication and you started to feel a little bit dizzy, then that suddenly you need to, you need to stop this medication. That's not true. So please have patience and try it out a little bit because your body reacts, of course, to medication. It reacts and the, this is, reaction is normal. Okay, but then the body can desensitize itself. Should medications be switched abruptly or tapered? Medication should be switched about one to two weeks. Decreasing it, so tapering, in the, tapering it down, dose step by step. So you decrease, 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 decrease dose in one to two weeks. And usually this is done in a hospital. It can be done outside also, but then the patient needs to come back and talk, so follow up visits, and the doctor has to uh, write a new uh, prescription, and then you can uh, take the lower dose, and then you can come back. And the doctor always asks about symptoms. But usually one to two weeks in the hospital, and then you're fine. Which medication do we usually use in an add-on therapy? So add-on. Second generation antipsychotics, lithium. Second antidepressants from a different class. Because we are actually in the initial phase taking antidepressants. It's called antidepressant because it's antidepression. So we have a second generation antidepressant. No, second antidepressant from a, uh, from a different class. Or a second generation antipsychotic. It's another thing. And lithium and then thyroid hormone. So second generation antipsychotics. Then we have lithium. Then we have second uh, second antidepressant from a different class. Then we have thyroid hormone. Okay, thyroid hormone. These are the ones we can uh, take as an adding treatment. The medication that should be avoided by patients with extra pyramidal side effects. Please look at uh, what extra pyramidal side effects are. This is a neurological symptom that you can see. It's pyramidal tract. That means in your spinal cord you have some pyramidal tract and these are extra pyramidal so these are not in the pyramidal tract these are symptoms coming from the extra pyramidal tract please check it out in wikipedia or uh, i will make a video about it in the future so atiprazole should be avoided when you have these kind of side effects like extra pyramidal side effects please remember atiprazole is usually but not only atiprazole there exists also other ones i did not list all of them i will maybe do it in future but Extra pyramidal side effects, one just that pops into my mind is aripiprazole. Of course, there are other ones. Please check that out. The second general antipsychotic that should be avoided in overweight patients are, for example, quetiapine, risperidone, or lanzapine. When we're dealing with antidepressants, mirtazapine comes to mind. But there exists also, of course, others. It is not only four that can cause an overweight in patients, but Second generation antipsychotics that we are giving now to resistant patients, you need to have that in mind that when you start to add this one, then uh, this will cause an, an increase in weight. And if the patient is already really overweight, then I would not really recommend to give quetiapine, respiradone, or olanzapine. So quetiapine, respiradone, a no-go in overweight patients. Please remember that because they will get even more overweight and then they will get all kinds of other problems as we know, hypertension, obesity, uh, metabolic syndrome, diabetes mellitus, and so on. So please watch out. Name medications that should be avoided in kidney or thyroid disease, lithium. Please never give lithium 
uh, in kidney disease or thyroid disease. These, these will harm your kidney, as you see, sad kidney there, or your sad thyroid gland, which should be avoided in the cardiovascular disease, thyroid hormone. Don't give thyroid hormone to these patients. What medication do we add to an antidepressant that is tolerated and that achieve little symptom relief? So let's say we have uh, an antidepressant that we we gave. It's very good tolerated, but uh, it, it, it achieved little symptom relief. So it's not good enough. Second generation antipsychotics or lithium. Second generation antipsychotics and lithium. Okay, good. Why do we add second generation antipsychotics or lithium instead of the second antidepressant or thyroid hormone? So why do we add instead second generation antipsychotics or lithium instead of giving another antidepressant or a thyroid hormone? Higher effect, uh, efficiency, that's all. And it has been proven that second generation antipsychotics or lithium is better in efficiency compared to another antidepressant or thyroid hormone. So efficiency, remember second generation antipsychotics. Which second generation antipsychotic medication are most commonly added? Aripiprazole, brekpiprazole, quetiapine, risperidone. Do you remember quetiapine, risperidone, causing weight gain? Remember? You, you need to always have, uh, have these things in mind. So aripiprazole looks like this. Brekpiprazole looks like this. It's a very similar name. Quetiapine looks like this, but of course you don't need to remember this, or only if you're dealing with chemical structures. But, but it's very hard otherwise to show pictures of medications. And I want to give a lot of pictures because I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in visual learning. And I know that quetiapine is hard to visualize. How, how should you visualize all these medications? And then I thought, okay, let's uh, look at how they actually look like. This is how, you, how they look like. This is the chemical structure of this. This is a risperdone. It looks like this. And uh, quetiapine looks like this. Okay? Maybe you will never uh, remember it, but maybe you will. Okay? When do we give brexpiprazole? If aripiprazole causes akathisia, this is a symptom, please check that out. It's very interesting because these are patients, for example, they, they are in the bed and they are shaking, akathisia. And we give brexpiprazole if you see this in patients, this is like restless legs almost, yeah? And then uh, you have this akathisia and then you start with the brexpiprazole instead. So you tried aripiprazole, but it did not work because you get the side effects and therefore I'm saying, Always check the side effects and then switch to another one if it's not working. Because all medications can cause side effects, but all medications does not cause side effects. You understand what the difference is? Maybe for me, uh, it would not cause this akathisia. So aripiprazole would be no, no problem for me. But for you, maybe it would cause akathisia and then we will uh, give you a brexpiprazole instead. So all patients, all people have different side effects from different medications. And this is, this is just the truth. And therefore, it, you cannot give one medication to everybody. You, you have to uh, accommodate, you have to look at the patient. Therefore, it's very good if you have a good doctor, okay? So please uh, always find a good doctor that can accommodate, that can actually look at you as a person, as a whole person, and always make a strategy that you are uh, taking the best medications available uh, according to the best knowledge available. How common is akathisia and brexpiprazole compared to aripiprazole? 50%. So it means that if the patient got aripiprazole and he got this akathisia, so shaking in the bed, then we switch to brex, brexpiprazole, maybe it will continue. In 50% of cases, unfortunately, it will, it will continue. But in 50%, it will not. And if it continues, of course, then please stop that and switch to another one. We have some other options. We said quetiapine, respir risperidone. And if the patient is not overweight, we will give this. As we said, in overweight patients, I would not give it. So 50% uh, uh, will be in brachypiprazole. Which of the second generation antipsychotics have fewer side effects? Aripiprazole. You see... So fewer side effects, yes, it can cause higher uh, number of akathisia, but in general, out of the second generation anti antipsychotics, aripiprazole have, the have fewer side effects as the other ones. So therefore, aripiprazole is a very good medication. You see, in one, if you look at it in one perspective, aripiprazole seemed so bad. It was 
causing this akathisia, this shaking in the bed. But in another point, if I if I take the statistics and turn around, yeah, but what about the other uh, side effects? The other medications have also a lot of other side effects. Then aripiprazole is really good. So all medications should be tailored to the patient. Are there differences in efficiency between different antidepressants? Yes. One medication can be better, better than the other, but the differences are so small that antidepressants are considered equally efficient. Did you get this? It means I cannot sit here and say that please take this medication because this is the best one. There exist no best medications. It all depends on the patient because the, 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 uh, the differences in efficiency are so small that we cannot make guideline to say that this medication should be taken. And therefore, I'm uh, giving you a lecture about all these antidepressants like I did in the video about initial treatment. I, give, I gave all medications and then the doctor needs to decide which one is good for the patient. And he can pick one, try it out. If it works, fine, go for it. If it does not, we have sw switching therapy. If it does not, then we have switching therapy. How many times? Two, three times we try the switching therapy. With monotherapy, as we said, then we do an adding therapy. This is a trial and error thing, okay? Very small differences, so they are actually equal, I would say. So please start with any antidepressant in the beginning, all depending on the side effect. So based on what should we then decide which antidepressants to use, that's the big questions. As I said, side effects. All You see, we have a lot of medications put down on the table here. This one can cause cramp. This can, can cause loss of appetite. This can cause itching. As you see, there are a lot of names there I've written down. That means that uh, depending on which the patient have, that will be the guide for us. Medication interactions, of course, we have a list. We can uh, put uh, two medications in this list and we will, uh, it will spot out, uh, spit out as, uh, a drug-drug interaction. There are many lists that you can find online that if you combine two medications, what does that cause? And this is what I'm telling you. Many doctors can, almost all doctors cannot memorize this that that would be impossible it's one million or one trillion combinations therefore we have lists of the most common medications that we just put in and then this system this computer would spit out it will tell us that please this drug drug combination is not advisable because of that 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 it's these side effects cost of course we need to decide on which antidepressant we use depending on the patient and how much money the patient has. Because there exist, uh, unfortunately, a lot of medications that are really expensive. They are new ones, and therefore they are really expensive. And maybe it's not always best to choose the best one and the most expensive one, or, the, or the, not the best one, the newest one. Let's take an older one, which costs cost very little. Because as you know, when you have a drug company uh, that is producing medications, usually they have a patent for 10 years. After these 10 years, then other companies can uh, come in and into, into the party and produce it themselves. Until this 10, 10 year, they have a monopoly. And usually when, when somebody have a monopoly on something, then they will increase the price. Especially if the company knows that in 10 years, all my competitors will go into the market and sell it for cheaper price. And therefore, they... Uh, uh, the newest drug is not always the best to choose for every patient. All depends on how much money you have. Patient preference, of course, patient can decide. I like this one. I like this one. You you, you need to uh, discuss this with the patient. Doctor and patient is is a teamwork. Name antidepressant that should be avoided in patients with seizures. Bupropion. Please don't do bupropion with patients with seizures. Bupropion, as we know otherwise, is not causing sexual dysfunction. So it's very good to pay, uh, guys, males, who don't want to have a sexual dysfunction. Bupropion is very good then. But as you see, if the patient has seizure, then you need to reconsider it and don't give that. So you see, it's very complex. It's not so easy. And I'm actually just scratching the surface of the information that I could give. But I, I don't want to give three hour long lectures. I think my lectures are long at the moment, too long actually. I would rather give you five minute lecture, but I'm 
going for quality and not quantity. If you don't have time to sit and listen to me, then please stop it and go to another video that explains something in four minutes. But unfortunately, I would say that information that can be explained in four minutes is just scratching the surface. It is not deep enough. Name, okay. Name antidepressant that should be avoided in patients with obesity. Mirtazapine. We had said that. Mirtazapine. And we said the antipsychotics. You remember olanzapine, quetiapine, risperdone. This will also causing obesity. So that should be avoided in cardiovascular disease. These are antidepressants. Tricyclic and monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So these are first generation. Uh, uh, antidepressants should be avoided in patients with cardiovascular disease. Tricyclics. They have three cycles and monoamine oxidase inhibitors. This is a very uh, beautiful 3D picture of that. These should be avoiding cardiovascular disease, first generation antidepressants. Is it necessary to switch to another class of antidepressant or just to another antidepressant which is within the same class? Did you understand what I asked for? You have an antidepressant. Should I change to another class of antidepressant, another type, or, or should I stay within the same class but just another medication, another type within the same class. So switching to another class of antidepressant is advisable. Because usually a one class of antidepressant will usually have very similar effect in the body. It's better to then, uh, and, and if, if this medication does not work, then please change the class because then the me mechanism will change also. So here's the SSRIs. We have uh, serotonin and norepinephrine uh, receptor inhibitors. We have three cyclic antidepressants, uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, atypical ones, so which change the class because within each class, there are many different types of medications within the same class, but instead we switch the class. What is the definition of severe depression? More than 20 points in the PHQ-9 test. So more than 10 points is depression, more than 20 points is severe depression. Between 10 and 20, we are mild to moderate. Maximum score is 27. The first line treatment is severe depression. Severe, that means more than 20 points. Resistant to medical treatment is electroconvulsive therapy. First line treatment in severe depression that is resistant to tablets. You gave tablets, it did not work. Electroconvulsive therapy. Don't be afraid of electroconvulsive therapy. We are, we are at 2020 and it's functioning really good. You have anesthesiologists, you have good clinics, and this is working. Otherwise, we would not do that, okay? We are not uh, sadistic in that sense that we, we want to harm you. We as a doctors, I mean, okay? So electroconvulsive therapy 2020 exists still because it's working in severe depression, which, which are resistant to medical treatment. Four indications of electroconvulsive therapy is, as we said, resistant severe depression, more than 20 points, persistent suicidal ideation with intent, so they are actually trying to do it, severe weight loss and dehydration due to food refusal, anorexia, and malignant catatonia. This is a typical position in a catatonic patient because they have usually very strange position. You see the head there, you see the arms, They're, they are actually like, like a wax and they are staring at you. It's a catatonia, malignant catatonia. And in these cases, it's very advisable to do electroconvulsive therapy. Good. What are the treatment options exist for patients not wanting electroconvulsive therapy? Antidepressants, of course, other antidepressants, intravenous ketamine and intranasal esketamine. Ketamine and esketamine are very usual in, in uh, structure intravenously. So in the vein, we can give ketamine, intranasally esketamine. Antidepressants are just other tablet, tablets. And uh, intravenous ketamine is very good. It's actually an anesthetic that anesthesiologists use to... Uh, calm the patient down and uh, make the patient sleep. It was used to, uh, used ma for many, many years for that, and it is still used for that. But it has been seen for some strange chemical reason. I don't want to go into the specifics because there are, there are only theories. Ketamine works against depression, and it's really good. It works in hours, and that's very amazing results, and I've seen it myself. Uh, I have given ketamine to patients and then one uh, a couple of hours later their depression is gone it, it it works like magic 
not for all patients, I would say, because I have also seen a patient who did not get good results. And then electroconvulsive therapy was done and boom, uh, the depression was less. Unfortunately, this patient was a typical patient that was very hard to treat. And this means that this patient has to repeat this electroconvulsive therapy and repeat ketamine for many, many years. Unfortunately, they exist so resistant patients also. But many patients will uh, benefit from it. And this ketamine also exists now uh, in, the, in the nose as a spray that you can take. And of course, this will only be given in the hospital. So you cannot go home with this spray and spray it. Uh, when you feel a little bit depressed, it does not work like that because it has a lot of side effects also. Like you get, you are, uh, you, you should remember this, this is an anesthesiologist tool to make you very calm and make you sleep. So this will be done in a hospital. But it's convenient that you don't need to have uh, an intravenous line uh, and it's uh, much quicker and so on. These are, there are some benefits with esketamine. It's a little bit too expensive at the moment, but it will be cheaper and cheaper with time. So these are the uh, options when the patient does not want electroconvulsive therapy. The disadvantages of ketamine or esketamine are it's more complicated, like instead of taking a tablet, you need to have an intravenous line, you need to monitor the patients and so on. Monitoring required meaning you, you check the vital parameters like blood pressure and so on. Then it's, uh, uh, and, and you see, you have the pulse, you have the blood pressure, you have the pulse oximeter checking your uh, oxygen level in your blood. And therefore it's more complicated. You need a doctor here and you need a specialized doctor and who is, who is having routine with ketamine and how much dose he should calculate, how much dose you give and so on. Uh, you, uh, and it's more complicated, okay? But advantages are really good, works in a couple of hours. It's not suitable for patients with previous psychosis. So please don't give uh, ketamine to patients with previous psychosis and only use for a short period of time, not use as a maintenance ther therapy. Means you give it, for example, two weeks and that was it. It's, it's not used for many, many weeks or many, many years or many months. It used short, quick action, bam, depression is gone, hopefully. Most of the time. Name some advantages with ketamine. As I said, fast onset of action hours compared to weeks with antidepressants. You remember antidepressants, you take tablets for six, six weeks, 12 weeks, or maintenance treatment for three years. Ketamine, you go there in a, a couple of hours, you can be uh, cured. And if that does not work, then you try it. Let's say if you try it on Monday, then uh, you, you get the new ketamine on Wednesday, then you get the new, if that does not work, then you get a new one on Friday, and maybe that will work. So sometimes it can take you one to two weeks. So as I said, one to two infusions per week for about one to four weeks. All depends on how well the patient reacts. Some react only by one infusion in one week, or some have to have two infusions per week for four weeks. It all depends on the patient. And as we see, these are, uh, patients are having an intravenous line and they are monitored with uh, blood pressure and so on, as I said. Which combination therapy is good against suicidal intent in patients with severe depression? So we have a patient here with suicidal attempt together with this depression. We give a lithium uh, next to this antidepressant. So not only antidepressant, but we give lithium when we have suicidal intent. Please remember that, suicide intent, lithium. Psychotic features and severe depression, antipsychotics. Psychotic, you hear in the name, antipsychotics. Psychotic features, antipsychotics. You give that. This is a combination therapy. Good, just remember that. And we have catatonia, this strange precision staring, uh, lorazepam, lorazepam. Okay? In catatonia, you give an extra lorazepam. So let's make a very quick review. Now we will rush through this presentation so that you get an overview again. Treatment, resistant depression mean that the response of at least two trials of antidepressants did not work. So we need to do uh, a more aggressive treatment like electroconvulsive therapy. So far, first two trials did not work and then that is treatment resistant. How do we know if the treatment is good? A PHQ-9 did not decrease by 50%. Did it not decrease here? What has to be done before changing the antidepressant therapy? We reassess the diagnosis again. We assess the adherence or compliance of the patients. We assess the number of weeks the therapy should be done. 
and then we refer the patient to a psychiatrist if we cannot handle this uh, depression. Definition of mild to moderate is less than 20 points and more than 10 points. So more than 10 points because it's depression and less than 20 points. The two treatment strategies that exist are adding treatment or switching treatment. Adding treatment is simply you add another medication to it. Switching treatment, you remove the first one and you add the second. That's it. Two treatment strategies that we have. Adding treatment, I repeat myself again. Add it, switching treatment, remove the first one. That's it. What can happen if you combine a monoamine oxidase inhibitor with another SSRI, so another antidepressant? Please remember serotonin syndrome and hypertensive crisis. Watch out. This is a typical drug drug interaction that can happen, but it does not happen all the time. But please be aware of this. Don't combine these uh, two uh, medications if you are not really, if you don't need to do it, please. Uh, hypertensive crisis also, you can get stroke and die. Please, please watch out. Uh, name three things that needs to be excluded in mild to moderate depression. No suicidal ideation, no psychosis, no aggressiveness in mild to moderate, moderate depression. No suicidal ideation, no psychosis, no aggressiveness. Do we need to treat patients with mild to moderate depression in hospital? No. But you have to follow up. Uh, you have to have follow up visits with the patient. So this patient can go home. Possible to change more than one medication at the same time? No. Switch or change one medication at a time. One medication at a time should be switched. When is it better to change a medication rather than adding a new one? Please change it when you have a lot of side effects with the first one. Then you change the medication instead of adding a new one to it. Is compliance better with monotherapy or combination therapy? With monotherapy. Benefit with switching therapy compared to adding therapy is that we reduce the side effects when we have a switching therapy. Uh, it leads to better compliance. We, it is cheaper and less, less drug interactions. How many times should one switch the monotherapy until deciding on adding a therapy? Three tries. Until then, you try monotherapy. For at least how much time should a medication be tested until switch to another one? Six weeks. Six weeks until you switch to another one. When should the medication be stopped early in the six weeks? By side effects. When you have side effects, then you switch earlier. Medication should be switched very slowly, so taper down in the hospital usually one to two weeks. It takes one to two weeks in the hospital and then you taper it down. The medication that we usually use an add-on is second generation antipsychotics or we have lithium or we have second antidepressant from a different class or we have thyroid hormone. This is usually medication that we can use as an adding treatment. Medication that we avoid by extrapyramidal side effects is aripiprazole, but also there exist others. That we avoid in overweight patients are quetiapine, risperidone, olazapine, these are antipsychotics. Quetiapine looks like this, risperidone, and olanzapine. Uh, those in avoided in kidney or thyroid disease is lithium. So please don't give lithium in kidney or thyroid disease. In cardiovascular disease, we avoid thyroid hormone. And medication that we add to an antidepressant, which achieved very little symptom relief, is second generation antipsychotic or lithium. Why do we add second generation antipsychotic or lithium instead of another antidepressant? Because of higher efficacy. It's better to add a second generation antipsychotic. Which second generation antipsychotic medication are most commonly added? We have aripiprazole, we have brexpiprazole, quetiapine, and risperidone. When do we give brexpiprazole? If aripiprazole causes akathisia, then we add brexpiprazole. The akathisia is 50% lower in brexpiprazole compared to aripiprazole, 50% lower. The second generation antipsychotics that have fewer side effects is aripiprazole. Aripiprazole have fewer side effects. The differences in efficiency between different antidepressants is, is very low. So there is almost no, so therefore uh, I don't have a preference for one or another. Instead, I give the best antidepressant tailored to that patient. Based on what should we then decide which antidepressant to use based on side effects, based on the drug-drug interactions, based on the cost, and based on the patient's preference. The antidepressant that should be avoided in seizures is bupropion. Please don't give bupropion in seizures. 
uh, don't give mirtazapine in obese patients and these other, other antipsychotics that we have, quetiapine, risperidone, and so. The cardiovascular disease, uh, the antidepressant that should be avoided is tricyclics, three cycles, and monoamine oxidase inhibitors. It is necessary to switch to another class of antidepressant? Yes. Please, it's better to change it to another class instead of switching to another medication within the same class. Switch to another class here. The definition of severe depression is more than 20 points, as we know, and the first-line treatment of severe depression is electroconvulsive therapy. The four indications of electroconvulsive therapy is resistant severe depression. It is persistent suicide ideation with, with intent. It is severe weight loss and dehydration due to food refusal. And it is malignant catatonia. These are four indications of electroconvulsive therapy. Four indications. The other treatment options that we can do when the patient does not want electroconvulsive therapy is, of course, other antidepressants. We try it out. We switch therapy. We give intravenous ketamine or give it intranasally, esketamine, almost the same molecule. And the disadvantages of this is that it's more complicated. We need a hospital with the expertise because we need to monitor the patient. It's not suitable for patients who had psychosis. And it's only used for a very short period of time, so it's not used as a maintenance therapy. The advantages with ketamine or esketamine is that it's very fast onset, so hours, compared to weeks with antidepressants. So please, if you want a fast response and you want to do magic for this patient who had depression and suddenly the patient got well, then ketamine is the choice. Intravenous ketamine is usually one to two infusions uh, for one to four weeks with monitoring in the hospital. Which combination therapy is good against suicidal intent and severe depression? Then we have antidepressant plus lithium. If you have uh, psychotic features, then we give antipsychotics with the antidepressants. And if you have catatonia, severe depression, then you give lorazepam. Lorazepam in catatonia. So that was it. Very, very long video. Uh, usually I give shorter ones, uh, but unfortunately I would say depression is uh, very, very complex, I would say. And uh, I don't want to scratch the surface. I really want you to have the deep knowledge that is uh, here. And um, if you have depression, I think that you can sacrifice, uh, let's say, two, three hours of searching on the internet or uh, two, two, three hours uh, looking at me if you want to have deep knowledge about depression, because I think it's worth worth it. Instead of living with depression, please sacrifice some hours and uh, then look at this video uh, many more times and look at my other videos dealing with depression. Because if you look at it more, then you will it will it will you will absorb it in your mind, and then you will start to see all the connections, and you will understand everything much much better. At the moment, it seems so much. And as a student, if you're a medical student, the same thing. It seems so much at the moment that you think that, oh, why did I spend 40 minutes or 50 minutes or one hour watching this video? But trust me, this is so deep. I have given you a very deep knowledge. And this will be remembered much better than if you're just scratching the surfaces and learning diseases very, very superficially, meaning you only know some things about each disease instead of going deep. I would say deep learning is the best learning and sacrifice your time instead of watching some series or some other uh, stupid stuff on the internet. Please sacrifice some time and you will be much, much clever. You will know these diseases and you will then hopefully get better and you will not have depression because this is a very sad disease. Suicide is a high, high uh, a really big, big problem. And uh, I see many young people dying. So I think these videos are important. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.